I first met my mentor, Gordon McKinlay, in 1988. I did a polo cross championship. I was a kid and I was playing polo cross in Australia, and we went to the state championships in a place called Wondowan, Queensland, Australia. And I was playing this game, and I, I was good with a stick and a ball and, and that, but I was terrible with my horsemanship ability, and my horse wasn't riding very good, that type of stuff. I would have been probably 13 years old at the time, or maybe 12. And uh, a guy had mentioned to my mother I should take some horsemanship lessons from a guy called Gordon McKinley. So my mother took the guy's name down and, and meant, wrote Gordon McKinley's name down. And then I'm not exactly sure how we found out, but my mother's pretty resourceful. So she found out that Gordon McKinley was having a horsemanship clinic in Longreach, Queensland, Australia. Longreach is way in the outback in the middle of nowhere in Queensland, Australia. So my mother and my grandparents drove me 22 hours to go to this horsemanship clinic. We just took a car. We didn't take a horse. I borrowed a horse there to use in the clinic. I distinctively remember he started the clinic and he started talking about horsemanship. He actually started the clinic doing a kind of a cult starting clinic with a wild horse. And after just watching him for 20, 30 minutes, everything just kind of came together for me. I knew I'd found my hero, meaning that as a kid growing up with horses, I always wanted better horsemanship. I always wanted to communicate better with them, but I just didn't know how to. I would always ask people questions that I thought knew more than me, which is pretty much friggin' everybody. But I never really got any good information. My grandmother is who what got me and my sister into horses, and she was very passionate about learning and growing, and she'd read books and things. But you know, back there in the late 80s, there wasn't anywhere near the information there's out there now on horsemanship and DVDs and books and streaming and downloads and YouTube and, you know, it's, it's a world of information out here now. Back when I was a kid, 13, 1988, there wasn't that much, at least in Australia, of this type of horsemanship. There was a bunch of English writing books that I had no real interest in, but as far as you know, the, the Western industry, quote unquote, natural horsemanship, any of this type of stuff, I, I didn't really have access to it or know even what it was until I met Gordon McKinley. And when I watched him, I knew that this guy had all the answers I was looking for. So I basically just soaked it up. I sat, you know, I was in the clinic and I rode in the clinic. I asked him a million questions. I about drove him insane with questions. And um, at the end of the three-day clinic, Gordon must have seen something in me or noticed something and he walked up to my mother and grandparents and he said if you want to send the boy down to me on school holidays in Australia they, they like like you have the summer off in America when Australia year-round school they have like eight weeks of school two weeks vacation eight weeks of school two weeks vacation at the end of the year you get six weeks off which is our winter time and your uh, our summertime and your winter here so he said, if you want to send him down to my place during school holidays, I'd be happy to you know, mentor him and help him a little bit. So that to me was a big game changer because that was the first guy that ever took any real interest in me that knew a lot about horses to want to try to help me and teach me. So we took him up on the offer. Every time uh, there'd be a break on school, I'd get on a Greyhound bus and you know, drive 20 hours to where he was. He'd pick me up off the bus and I'd just walk for him for free and learn and clean barn, clean stall, do whatever he wanted me to do. I did it just because I wanted to be around this guy and, and ask him what he knew and learn and so forth. So that's kind of how I first met him is through that clinic. And then I did that for two years, going down to his place, him and his wife Enid McKinley for school holidays from like 13 to 15. And then when I, at the end of my 15 year old year, I quit school and um, started a full-time apprenticeship with him. That's when I really got immersed in the horsemanship because I'd figured out that's what I wanted to do for a living. Well, I actually wanted to be a horse trainer for a living. I never wanted to teach people or be a clinician. Um, I wanted to actually train horses. Now, Gordon did a lot of training, but he also did lots of clinics and schools and workshops all over the country. So I traveled with him and was his assistant and right-hand man. And I got a tremendous amount of, of knowledge and um, experience, you know. I worked for Gordon and Enid for free for two years, but it wasn't really free. In my mind, they were paying me millions every day. Um, they gave me a, a little old fifth wheel caravan to live in, to sleep in really, 
I ate in the house with them. They provided food and lodging, basically, little old caravan. I ate with them as part of their family. And I just pretty much worked seven days a week for two years. You know, at that age, what else was I going to do? I didn't have a girlfriend, didn't have a car. You know, one of Gordon's famous sayings that I still remember to this day, he used to look at me and say, Clinton, if you can stay away from women and cars until you're 30, you'll be a millionaire. And uh, I didn't realize how true that was until now, okay? But that was a joke of his. But but I just worked seven days a week for, for two years. And they didn't pay me anything, but I didn't want anything. I just wanted knowledge. Lots of people, as I started developing my skills and getting better, people, guys would walk up to me and say, you know, how much is Gordon paying you? And me being kind of naive kid, I'd just say, well, nothing. He didn't pay me anything. And they'd say, man, that's no good. You know, you come work for me and... And I'll have you start some cults and you can do this and I'll pay you $300 a week. Well, $300 a week to me back then was like a massive amount of money. But something in my gut just knew that, and I, this is where I was a lot wiser for my age and what I was, you know, what my age was. In my gut, I kept thinking, well, what happens when I start these 20 cults? What happens to me then? If I leave Gordon and burn that bridge, I got nothing with you after you use me up for starting your cults. So I just politely decline and I just stayed working for Gordon. Those two years that I was there were the foundation of what Down Under Horsemanship is. You know, I joke when I say I work for free, but I make millions of dollars a year now from that information. If I would have walked up to Gordon McKinley at 15 years of age and said, listen, you should pay me to learn how to train horses. You should pay me to learn your method. He would have said, get lost, jump in the lake. You know what I mean? Um, but I didn't. I went to him hat in hand and said, I want to be you. I'll do whatever it takes to be you. And he said, sure, come along. This is what it's going to take. And um, I did it. It's as simple as it gets. You know, I, people today, when you say work for free, they, they just they, they can't even comprehend that somebody would do that. To me, it was a no brainer. I couldn't. I was the happiest kid in the world. I was just happy that he wasn't charging me to be there, let alone getting paid, you know. I remember when I was there on school holidays, I was probably about 14 at the time, Gordon had a, uh, another guy working for him that was starting cults and doing Gordon's deal. And somehow this guy was f fucking off or doing something stupid. And Gordon had a hell of a temper on him. Like anybody that knows Gordon, they know that he could fly off the handle at any point and he had a hell of a temper on him. Okay? He was a great guy, but he did have a temper on him. Not with the horses, but with people. So he rips into this guy and rips him a new arsehole, blah, 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 and Gordon walks off. I don't remember why he got in trouble, but he did. And I just, when it, Gordon would start yelling and screaming, I'd start ducking for the, for get under a table, get under a tree. I just try to avoid him like the plague because the last thing I want to do is get in trouble by him. You know, he was my hero. So that was the last thing I wanted to do was get in trouble by him. So anyway, Gordon left and I went back over to the yard where this guy was and this guy was mumbling under his breath and he was bitching about getting, getting his arse ripped and again, I was just a kid listening. And I said to him, I said to this guy, I said, I don't even remember his name, I, I know he looked at his face, I said to him, I said, um, are you getting paid to be here? And the guy looked at me and says, well, hell yes, I'm getting paid to be here. I better be paid, I'm not doing this for free. And I didn't say it at the time, but you know what went through my mind? I thought to myself, you lucky son of a bitch. How did you figure out how to get paid to train horses all day and learn from this guy? How did you get that done? I'm, I'm doing it for free and think I'm the luckiest kid in the world. You're getting paid to do it. But he didn't look at it that way. That guy didn't think he was lucky, but he was there to learn. I always had that attitude that I knew, don't know how, intuition, whatever the touchy-feely thing you want to fucking say, but I knew I was amongst somebody great. I knew I was around somebody that was world-class at what they did. I knew that this was a special moment, and I sure as shit better take advantage of it. So call it luck, it was, but it's also me being smart enough and my parents to know that this kid's staying here and going to be mentored really well. Looking back on it, I'd actually have to say the greatest lesson, the most valuable lesson, the lesson that I've made the most money from that Gordon taught me really had nothing to do with horses. It had to do with work ethic. Gordon was a workaholic. We used to call him the old goat because he just climbed the mountain. He wasn't terribly fast, wasn't terribly sexy at it, 
but he just never stopped climbing until he reached to the top. I was expected to work just as hard as he did, and I did. So I went, went from a 15-year-old kid in high school to living like an adult and a man, like pretty much overnight. So I had to grow up very quickly, and I'm glad I did. He taught me the importance of a work ethic. He always used to have a saying, nobody ever drowns in their own sweat, okay? Sweat is the, the most freest thing you get because you get more of it tomorrow. Sweat costs nothing. You get more sweat tomorrow. So you always have to put in sweat equity to develop your skill set or develop what you want to be great at or a champion at or whatever. So those first two years, I worked a tremendous amount of hours. Like an average day at Gordon's place would be 14 hours a day. That wasn't even really a long day. That was just kind of an average day. And, you know, when you live on a farm like that, you just kind of do it seven days a week. You don't, there's no real time off. When it rained, we got a little time off because there was no indoor arena or anything like that. So if it was too wet to ride, you'd stay in the house and me and him would watch horse training videos or horse shows or something like that. But looking back on it, that work ethic is probably been my most valuable commodity. And that's, that's something that a work ethic will always beat talent. A work ethic will always beat natural ability. A great work ethic, passion, wanting to be number one and, and doing whatever it took to get there. You know, I remember Gordon, <clears throat> he also trained, he trained horses, but he also did farming. He grew alfalfa hay or lucerne or alfalfa hay. He grew watermelons, pumpkins, irrigation. He grew all kinds of crops. Well, when you worked for him, you didn't just train horses. You did everything. We bowed hay. We picked pumpkins. We did watermelons. You, you name it. We picked the crop, and we did all of that. I drove tractors, you name it, we did it. And I remember one year, it was around Christmas time, which is our summer in Australia. Winter, it's America, it's winter, but in Australia, it's summer. And we had to be picking pumpkins. And these are big old, I don't know the name of the pumpkin, but in Australia, like in America, you don't really use pumpkins. Like, we eat pumpkins in Australia. It's not really a dessert like pumpkin pie is in America. In Australia, pumpkins are like a, a squash or a vegetable, kind of like a potato or, you know, sweet potato, something like that. So we actually use pumpkin as, a, as an actual pot vegetable. And they get really big. There's different kinds, but the ones he picked, the biggest motherfuckers in the world, okay? So they're like this big, okay? So we're out there, it's around Christmas time, and me and some other guys from the Guru Polo Cross Club came down. Rodney Griggs was one of them, and I can't remember. There was two or three other guys that came with Rodney. And Rodney Griggs, I haven't seen him in years, but if he's watching this, uh, uh, we need to get together, mate. But Rodney came down with some other guys that wanted to learn horsemanship. Well, Gordon was always a pretty good teacher. He, he, he wouldn't charge people to come down and learn, but he just sure as shit walked the hell out of you while you were down there. So he basically got free labor for his farming while, while we came down to learn horsemanship, which is a good deal, okay? But it's Christmas time. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon, and it's hot as hell. It's like 105 degrees, you know, Celsius, not Celsius, but 105 degrees, humidity's through the roof. I mean, you're just about falling over dead, dying from heat. And myself and all the guys from Guru, Rodney Griggs, we're all, we're all stopped. We all went and sat under a tree and grabbed some water, and we're just exhausted. We're about ready to pass out. And there's old Gordon, just out there in the pumpkin field, just picking pumpkins. He's just like a machine. He wasn't the fastest guy out there, but he would just never stop. And I looked up at him, and here's this guy, he's probably 65 at the time, still walking his ass off in this field, picking up 40-pound pumpkins and putting them on a trailer. And here's me and these other guys, half his age or a quarter of his age, and we're, we're under the tree exhausted, and he just shamed us into it. We just got up and went back to work again. Because we couldn't stand the embarrassment of a guy 65 years old just out beating us and out working us. And that's what we did, okay? He was just a workaholic. And he really worked like that to the day he dropped dead. But that was probably the most valuable lesson he taught me was a work ethic. Nobody ever drowns in their own sweat. Very few people in the world ever fail in business by working too hard. They often fail by not working hard enough, not sacrificing enough, but they often don't fail from working too hard.